Hello ladies and gents. You know what I realized? I tend to respond to very long videos and never finish them. Like last week I got about halfway through and stopped, and this isn't the only time I've done this. Usually when a video is too long, I respond to a portion of it, with plans of going back to finish the rest later, but I never do. Did you know, my very first video was actually part 1 to a series responding to Kent Hovind's movie. It was meant to be at least a 3-parter, but I never got back into it, and after a while I admitted to myself that I never would finish the series and remove the part 1 from the title. Honestly, this just shows how impatient I get sometimes. I'm always looking for new content, but maybe that's not a bad thing, I don't know. But today we're going to actually finish responding to last week's video. That's right, Flat Earthers have nothing on science. Even after this famous astronomer and mathematician's death, there were people swearing they saw the transit of this planet. Okay, so as a refresher from last week's video, he's talking about a hypothetical planet called Vulcan which was mathematically predicted by Verrier to be the first planet of the solar system due to the abnormality of Mercury's orbit, but then it was never found and instead the orbit is now explained through relativity. I addressed this in last week's video which hopefully I remember to link in the description. Science is about making hypotheses and testing them. When they fail or when a new idea gains evidence, then the original hypothesis is dismissed. That's just how the scientific method works. Vulcan was one of those rejected hypotheses. It's just not right to bring up this example and claim that science was wrong when science was what corrected the false idea of Vulcan's existence. And again, they even had sightings of this phantom planet. Oh, but science was never wrong, we can trust them, right? I mean, actually, there were no sightings of that planet, and that's the primary reason why that hypothesis was dismissed. But if you're talking about regular people who claim that they have seen Vulcan, well, regular people aren't part of the scientific community, and their anecdotal sightings mean nothing. I should uh, not forget to mention that something is wrong with even this picture. What is it? Uh, Venus and Mercury, they, we have to swap positions. Even though we've sent probes supposedly to each one of these planets around the sun and have had them there for quite a while, all of a sudden now, I guess mathematically it doesn't work. Mercury is further away from the sun than Venus. Isn't that interesting? Wow, we can really depend on science. Uh, what? Hang on, give me a second to uh, process what you just said. Yeah, give me one second here. No, that claim was never made, or at least not that I'm aware of. If one particular scientist or something claimed that, then it might have been just that one scientist being delusional. But there's no scientific consensus about Venus being closer to the Sun than Mercury. There is, however, the idea that on average, Mercury is closer to the Earth than Venus. And perhaps that's where you got your misconception. In fact, Mercury is on average the closest to any planet. And that's due to its orbit and that distance is determined by any planet's present position around the Sun. I don't think you could have possibly gotten that mixed up with distance to the Sun though. That would just be stupid, right? Now, I don't claim to be a great artist or even have the right constellations listed here, but as we all notice, the constellations move in a steady fashion east to west in our sky. They always have, and they always will. Unless you're close to the North Pole or South Pole, that is, in which the stars and constellations rotate around a certain point, counterclockwise in the north and clockwise in the south. But anywhere else, yeah, you can think of it going from east to west. And the picture that I showed before with us going around the sun pretty much in a straight plane would actually explain, it's one of the explanations of how we can have the constellations move from east to west in our sky as the year progresses, correct? Well, that would actually be irrelevant because the trajectory of the stars are mostly due to the rotation of the Earth. No matter what alignment the solar system is, the Earth is always rotating. So, how can you reconcile that with what science now says is our orbit around the sun? Let's take a look at that. Yeah, let's jump right in. Well, you see, I guess they had to come up with something new. So the planets don't just go around the sun in a, generally speaking, a plane, but now they corkscrew around the sun. Oh, the sun is like a comet dragging the planets in its wake. If you actually tried to understand the implications of this model, then you wouldn't be so confused right now. Yes, that's a simulation that shows the orbit of the planets around the sun, as well as the solar system's overall path in the Milky Way. It seems like a comet that shoots through space, but it's simply just rotating around the center of the galaxy. So why is it that the stars are in the same position at night in our perspective? It's because the other stars are moving as well. While we're shooting through space, so is everything else. So in our perspective, they appear to be in the same spot every night. Now, that's not to say that their trajectory exactly matches ours, but that they don't move significantly enough for us to notice 
a big difference. But if you gave it millions of years, then yes, the positions of the constellations and stars would change. The North Star would no longer be a North Star, for example. However, over the short span that modern humans have been on this Earth, there hasn't been enough time for any significant changes to notice. And now I must bring up my second point. If people were indeed fabricating this model, why would they create such a weird and outlandish model such as this one? Think about it. If I wanted to make up the reality of the Earth with the purpose of tricking people, why make something that is difficult to understand and can be easily mistaken to conflict with other parts of science? Personally, I would keep it as simple as possible, wouldn't you? Oh, here we go. This is a real big winner. This has affected you and or your family. Why? Because the recommendation of our health sciences has told us for decades that regular fat, like which comes from regular butter, isn't good for you. That causes heart attacks. Well, yeah, saturated fats tend to be solids, and when they're in your bloodstream and don't dissolve, you know, because they're fats, they can aggregate in crucial vessels. Let's say it lands in your coronary arteries. You're going to get a heart attack if blood flow is restricted to your heart muscles. It's kind of basic biology. So they introduced something called trans fats. Oh, it comes in margarine. In fact, margarine is a trans fat. Okay, first of all, you make it sound as if people invented trans fats. They didn't. There was no, quote, introducing trans fats. They're already naturally found in certain foods we eat. Second of all, margarine isn't just made of trans fats. They also have saturated fats, various unsaturated fats, and carbohydrates as well. And they got all the fast food industry to switch over from healthy oils to these trans fats. And what is the result? Heart attacks. Well, margarine became popular due to its low price. People also tried to stay away from saturated fats. Now, trans fats are pretty bad, but that doesn't mean saturated fats are good. The move towards consuming margarine was mostly due to the demonizing of saturated fats, along with the ignorance of the detriments of trans fats. But that's science, right? It takes it one step at a time. We don't discover everything all at once, after all. When new nutrition information pops up, it's natural that people would want to adjust their lifestyles accordingly. But knowledge is always being updated. Science doesn't tell people how to behave. All it does is present new discoveries. What you decide to do with that information is up to you. You can't blame science for the public people trying to switch their butter because it's what it's hyped up to be. Note that the opinion of individual scientists is different than science itself. It's important to make that distinction. Now they recognize it, but guess what? If you go to the hospital to this day, I should know I'm a heart patient. If you have had a heart attack, you can't have butter. They'll still give you trans fat, which clogs your arteries and leads to heart attacks. I don't know what doctor would give you trans fats if you're a heart patient. Obviously, I can't say for sure what your doctor was claiming or if that happened at all, but I have a feeling he was actually referring to unsaturated fats. Now I could possibly do an entire series on all the great fallacies of science, both ancient and modern time. Yeah, you know, how about we change the topic a bit? Why don't we talk about all the medicine that has been developed that has saved millions of lives? How you could take antibiotics and be cured of your infections? Or how it has developed computers and phones that you've now taken for granted? You're fishing through everything that science has given us, picking only a selected few to present. Which is either something you've gotten completely wrong about, or an outdated claim in the distant past that modern science has now corrected. The famous Nebraska man. In any case, you'll find here that this was the first missing link the ape man of North America. And they took this one tooth and they actually built up all kind of skeletons and things like that. Only one little mistake. They didn't take into consideration that there could be any wearing down of the tooth from any kind of um, weathering and things like that. Uh, as it turns out, this is what it came from. Since you're looking at Wikipedia, let's see what the Wikipedia article says on the Nebraska man. In the beginning of the retraction subsection, it says, From its initial description, Hesperopithecus was regarded as an inconclusive find by a large portion of the scientific community. And then later on it says, Although the identity of H. Harold Cookie did not receive general acceptance in the scientific community, so on and so forth. So as you can see, it never really reached scientific consensus, even though the finding was published. Uh, nothing much else to say here. So I will leave it at that. With, uh, for this episode anyway, of all the different fallacies uh, of science. You know what? I admit, science isn't perfect. It doesn't always give us the right information at all times, and it can be faulty to some degree. But in concept, science is perfect. The only thing is that scientists are human, and humans make mistakes, and are influenced by personal incentives. In other words, it's not that the scientific method isn't accurate, but that people aren't perfect. Now, that doesn't mean to question thoughtlessly on what science says. It's still very accurate in general, and is the best method we have to obtaining truth. Look at the number of views people like Simon Dan and the professor here have. And please note, these people do no science whatsoever. How about me? I did some science regarding cancer. Does that count?
Whereas we do, we actually go out and do the work. Yeah, we make mistakes, but we're out there doing the work. Yeah,、um, I think there are better things for you to do that actually contribute to society. I don't know, just a thought. That's the end of the video, everyone. Whoa, I actually finished responding entirely to a video that's over ten minutes long. What a workout! Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Biggest shoutouts to Fire Shard and Mark Orsini for their loyal support on Patreon. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next week.